Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Colinati. Today I'm going to talk about my favorite books of 2017. All 20 of them. Because I decided I was not going to narrow it down any further. 2017 was a really terrible year in many ways for a bunch of people. For me, personally, it was not that bad of a year. And I somehow came out of it with a really great reading year when I did not expect to. So I decided that I was not going to play favorites with my favorites. I'm not going to cut it down to an arbitrary top 10 just because I'm supposed to have a short list. Like, who makes up these rules? I could have my own rules. I want to celebrate every single one of the books that I think were my favorites of the year, that I loved reading the most, that impacted me the most, and that I still think about now. Because I can. As far as order goes, there really isn't one, though if you're paying very close attention you may notice that the first 10 are in the order in which I read them and then the second 10 are also in the order in which I read them. That's the result of how I made the list and I didn't feel like reorganizing it in any other way. <laughs> so with that said, let's get straight into it. Number one is The Invention of Nature, Alexander von Humboldt's New World by Andrea Wolff. This is a biography of Alexander von Humboldt who was an incredible incredibly important and influential scientist who's mostly been forgotten even though he had a huge impact on the next generation of scientists whom we remember very well. This was probably the first real biography I've ever read, the first one that I elected to read on my own, and I loved it. Wolf's writing style is perfect. She draws you in to Humboldt's life as if it is a story. She tells people's lives as stories, and I love the way that she quotes them. She uses bits from their correspondence and their own words to bring them to life again on the page. This book is just packed with so many fascinating details about Humboldt's life and the era of scientific inquiry that he lived in, and I've been compelled by this to go off and read everything else that Wolf has written because a lot of it is in the same time period and just as wonderful. But this is where my love for Wolf's books began. Number two is China Mountain Zhang by Maureen F. McHugh, one of those rare books that I knew was going to be a favorite from the very first chapter. You can just feel that little zing, you know it's going to be the one. Um, this is kind of a near future science fiction, possibly dystopia novel, but not really. Um, in it, America has gone through a socialist revolution, China is now the dominant world power, including in the US, and the main character, who is American-born Chinese, is gay, which is highly stigmatized and illegal, and he's trying to live his life, mostly falling through the cracks, um, in this big system that doesn't like what he actually is, and he needs to get training and get a career and make money and live. It was wonderful. I did an entire video about it which was very gushy and possibly not very coherent. Number three is Embassy Town by China Mieville. At this point, if you've watched my channel for a little while, you've probably noticed I have this thing for science fiction about aliens and their languages, communicating across species boundaries, but mostly alien linguistics. And this book has all of that. It is really about how difficult it is and how truly impossible sometimes it might be to communicate with an alien species that doesn't think, doesn't operate the way that you do. And also about how language can affect the way that things think and that changing thinking might involve changing language, vice versa. It was fascinating and I think I did a better job at explaining what the book is about in a weekly wrap-up at one point. Number four is Orbital Cloud by Taiyo Fuji, translated from Japanese by Timothy Silver. This is a science fiction thriller that actually really thrilled me and had me glued to the page. Basically, North Korea manages to launch something into orbit, which is going to threaten, possibly destroy, all the satellite communications for the entire world, and a group of international scientists, spies, etc. has to stop this. It's a lot about orbital mechanics and how you get things into orbit and out of orbit and moving around up there. I ate up all of the details. I love the technology. I love the characters. It was really thrilling. And I did a full review of it. 
Number five is The Raven Stratagem by Yoon Ha Lee, another one I've already done a separate video on. This is the sequel to Nine Fox Gambit, which I also loved, though I'm thinking at this point that The Raven Stratagem was even a little bit better than Nine Fox Gambit for me. Just a little bit. It is a very different book, so comparing the experience of reading them is maybe not the best, but I loved being immersed in the world again. Uh, it's very tricky to figure out, and I love that. I love that it's not spoon-fed to the reader, and I definitely have my favorite characters, some very dubious in nature that I might be rooting for. <laughs> Cannot wait for the last one. <laughs> Number six is a bit of a shocker because I initially picked up this book based solely on the beautiful fiery cover art by Victo Nye, and then I loved the inside of it, and it also broke my heart a little bit. This book is Amberlo by Laura Elena Donnelly. I wouldn't call this fantasy because I don't think there's magic in it, but it's definitely set in a secondary world, kind of modeled on Germany pre-World War II. It is about the rise of fascism in a state, particularly in the city of Amberlo, and the inhabitants that have to deal with this. Um, the characters are a smuggler, a dancer, and a spy, and will they get out in time or will they stay and fight from the inside? I believe this is Donnelly's debut novel, and what a debut it is. Number seven is A Kraken Creation by Jennifer A. Doudna and Samuel H. Sternberg. This is a nonfiction work about the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 and the call to action to discuss how to regulate this technique for gene editing and to consider the ethical implications of its use. So CRISPR is a new method for editing genes. It is very cost-effective, quick, precise, accurate, in a way that a lot of the previous clunky, expensive methods were never going to be. I love this book for like three reasons. I mean, the first one is that I just love reading about genetics, and this was a really great book about genetics and how it actually works. But two is that it's an incredibly compelling story about a scientific discovery that happened very quickly. The third thing is that I just really appreciate that Doudna herself, as person who's responsible for this discovery and is poised to make a lot of money from it, is actually the one coming out and saying, hey, we need to think about the ethics of this, we need to regulate it, we have to be responsible for our own creations and discoveries. And I just really admire that attitude. Number eight is The Stone Sky by N.K. Jemisin, the stunning conclusion to an already very strong series. I can't say too much about it because, you know, spoiler risk, but I really feel like Jemison stuck the landing perfectly on this one. It's probably one of the best series conclusions I've ever read, balancing, giving all of the answers that I expected, but not going too far and over explaining. And it didn't go on too long. It, it ended when the story needed to end. It just, it was amazing. <laughs> Number nine is Raising the Stones by Sherry S. Tepper. I love this book mostly because I felt at the end of it that I'd gone on a very long journey and loved every step along the way, and then got to a conclusion and the wrapping up of all the various storylines where it was almost wish fulfillment because I, I got the endings I hoped for and the good things I hoped for, but they weren't so perfect as to feel contrived. It was like, it was a balancing act. It just worked. But I also love this book because it finally overcame my two major criticisms of Tepper's work that I read previously. It did everything that I had hoped her works would do, um, with multiple points of view, multiple religions, and lots of subtleties, and good and bad things for both, where it's very hard to point at any one thing and say, oh, this is what's wrong and needs to be fixed. There are bad guys, but there's like actual explanations for how they became bad guys. And really it's a story of different religions conflicting with each other, and a lot more as well. Number 10 is The Sea in Summer by George Turner, a science fiction novel about the social impact of climate change in the far future. This one I've already done a full review on, so I'll refer you to that if you want to know more, but I think it says a lot that this is one of those rare books that at the end of the year I had to upgrade to a five-star book because I just kept thinking about it and how great it was. Number 11 is Six Wakes by Murr Lafferty. The crew of a spaceship in deep space wake up in freshly cloned bodies and have to figure out which of them killed all of their previous bodies. 
It's a murder mystery in a locked room scenario, in this case on a spaceship, and I ate it up for the mystery, for the cloning aspect, which was very well thought out. And then it had to be on this list because I kept being reminded of this book all year long. I would read something and connect it back to this. I've also done a full review of it, which will be much fresher thoughts on it than I have a year later. Number 12 is Seven Surrenders by Ada Palmer. This is some weird, metaphysical, philosophical, possibly utopian, far future science fiction. I don't even know if that's a good description because I'm, I'm not sure if it's actually a utopia or not, but it's definitely very into metaphysics. Um, this is the direct sequel to To Like the Lightning, which was also one of my favorite books of 2016. Very much on par with the quality of the first book, and I loved it more because I got so many answers. A lot of things pay off in this one, and it had my mind just madly churning, trying to figure things out before they're explicitly answered by characters. So it was, it was fun, just the story and the ideas, but also the joy of trying to figure things out before it's revealed. I, I loved it and I can't wait for more. Number 13 is Amatka by Karen Tidbeck, translated from Swedish by the author. In the past, I may have criticized some books for being heavier on atmosphere than actually telling a story, but this one I loved because of the way that it felt, because of the atmosphere created by the writing, which is very simple and efficient but clear. I don't know how to describe the atmosphere of it. In some ways, it makes me feel melancholy, just thinking of this world, which is rather bleak, but it was beautiful too. This is another story that also uses language. Um, language is used to um, create and shape physical objects from this alien environment, and the names and labels of things have to be constantly reinforced so that they don't melt back into this alien goo substance. Some really cool ideas, but mainly I love the way it made me feel and that I actually dragged out reading the book so that I could prolong the experience. Number 14, no surprise to finally see this on a favorites list, New York 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson. I really fail at describing the plot of this book in a nutshell because there's so much going on in it, but this is a climate change environmental novel that is also very heavily about the economy and the financial world. There's a lot of info dumping about how all this works. Number 15 is another book about genetics called The Epigenetics Revolution by Nessa Carey. This one, I will say up front, I don't know if this will really be other people's favorite book. It is not a light, easy nonfiction read by, by any means, but for me, I learned so much from this book. It was a much more technical, cutting edge book about recent discoveries in genetics rather than just rehashing the history of the field again, and that is what I wanted. It read a bit like a textbook at times, but that's also kind of what I wanted. I think this was the first book on genetics proper that I read in 2017, and it really got me off on this journey to read more in that area, and it was extremely rewarding. Number 16, The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, translated from Italian by William Weaver. I have spoken about this book multiple times as one of my favorite reads of the year. I'm not sure what more to say about it than that. It is, it's a mystery novel and I love the mystery in it. I love the untangling of clues and more mysteries and deaths piling up. It's also historical fiction and it really dives into theological discussions which I didn't always follow, but the whole thing is rich in detail, wonderfully told, just a good story that will really appeal to people who love libraries and books because, you know, a library is at the heart of the story. Number 17 is The Fall of Language in the Age of English by Minai Mizumura. This is translated from Japanese by Juliet Winters Carpenter and Mari Yoshihara. I would basically say this is an extended essay in which Mizumura is talking about choosing to write and publish in one's native non-English language in a world dominated by English, where English is an international language and kind of a default language for books and publishing, and not publishing in English can put a writer, especially a new writer, at a disadvantage and greatly limit their reach and how many, how many readers they can have. This is also 
um, Mr. Morta's thoughts on languages, on national languages, local languages, um, and the literatures, the, the canons of literature that various languages have or don't have and why and, and what that means and what that feels like. I'm not sure that I can agree or disagree with or even pass judgment of any type on what Mizumura is saying in this book, but for me, it made me think much more about what reading translated fiction does for me. Because when I'm reading translated works, I I'm reading something translated into a language that the author wasn't thinking in, wasn't writing in, and didn't choose to publish in. So what does that mean? And the sense that I'm really accessing something different, a different way of living, a different way of thinking and of telling stories when I read something that was not written in the language that I think in. Number 18 continues the language theme with The Art of Language Invention by David J. Peterson. I love this because the topic, creating invented languages, has been very near and dear to me for uh, most of my life at this point, um, but this is also just a really great book about how to create constructed languages in a realistic fashion, about grammar and linguistics and how languages actually work and evolve. So appealing in many ways, very well written, quite funny, but also it felt like it was reconnecting me to my childhood in some ways. <laughs> The last two books on this list I would categorize as plain old fun reads that I flat out enjoyed. Number 19 is Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. I really loved seeing the rise and evolution of one species pitted against the fall and de-evolution of another, and never thought I would be rooting so much for spiders. And last, number 20 is All Systems Red by Martha Wells, about Murderbot, a soldier unit that cracks its governance module, becomes autonomous but really doesn't want to have anything to do with other people. It's very anxious and just wants to watch trashy entertainment videos all the time, but it might have to end up doing more. <laughs> And those are my favorite books of 2017. Perhaps an odd mishmash of books I enjoy just for the sheer great storytelling and fun, and some more serious things that changed the way I thought or set me off on new directions to read in. I know I call that a success. I have two aims with my reading, to enjoy things but also to learn things. And I think that for once, my favorites list of the year really reflects both of those things and not just having fun. And with that, I think I will bring my year of reading to a close. Thank you very much for watching and thank you all of you for making it a wonderful year for me as well. There is always the pleasure in reading, but I also have the pleasure of sharing what I'm reading and my thoughts with all of you and hearing your thoughts as well and I appreciate that very, very much. So thank you, and I will talk to you again in my next video, and until then, bye.